This week on The Gadget Show, the amazing phenomenon of multiplayer online gaming, where real-life fortunes can be made in virtual worlds. Can you revive your precious technology after an accidental soaking? I run a thorough test. But Susie goes further, pushing gadgets that claim to be waterproof right to the edge of destruction. Earlier this year, a 22-year-old Australian student bought a 6,000-acre island with a castle on it. How much did he pay for it, you might ask? Well, I'll tell you. Just £15,000. Quite a bargain? Well, there are one or two catches. I'll read you the estate agent's particulars to see if you can spot them. The island boasts beautiful beaches ripe for developing beachfront property. There's an old volcano with rumours of fierce creatures within. The outback is overrun with mutants and an area with a high concentration of robotic miners guarded by heavily armed assault robots. Hmm. The student bought an island that's entirely virtual. It only exists on the internet in a huge web-based game called Project Entropia. But it's an investment that should net him some real-world income. Welcome to the next big thing. Massive multiplayer online gaming. They may be computer games, but they've spawned a billion dollar real world economy where people buy and sell their virtual assets, like islands, or weapons, or books of spells. Millions play them, and it's a phenomenon that's intriguing financial analysts the world over. They work like this. The game's developers have a bank of computer servers on which they host a virtual world. This enables hundreds of thousands of players to meet up and play simultaneously. Even when you log off, the virtual world continues expanding and developing thanks to the efforts of thousands of other game players, all in different time zones. Indeed, certain games have been running continuously for over six years. But up until now, massive multiplayer online games have been the reserve of hardcore PC and Mac-based gamers. However, the next generation of consoles have been designed to handle them, and deals are being done left, right and centre by Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo to secure the big-name multiplayer games for their consoles. Those big names at the moment are Final Fantasy XI, secured for the Xbox 360, EverQuest, actually made by Sony, Star Wars Galaxies, also Sony, and the most popular game of all, World of Warcraft, a fantasy game that's only been around for a year or so, but already has over two million subscribers. I personally have been playing a massive multiplayer online game for about four years. It's called World War II Online Battleground Europe, the Virtual Battle Series Volume 1, Western Europe, 1940-42. Snappy title. I'm a non-commissioned officer in the British Army, Corporal Slaphead, and I'm free to roam a playing area that's over 11 million square miles. It covers much of Northern Europe in the 1940s, reproduced as faithfully as possible using GPS, archive photos and maps from the period. Right now, I'm camped outside a town called Musch. It's owned by the Germans. Every player that you see on this battlefield, Arrow, the guy in front of me, there's a, another player there up on the hill. He's in a panhard which is a very light armoured vehicle, see that? Pyro, his name is. All of these people and the Germans that we're fighting is like me, it's someone sat in front of their computer. They could be anywhere in the world, Japan, America, Germany, France. In fact, the guy driving the Jeep I've just hitched a lift on is actually sitting playing on his computer in New York. Thing to bear in mind again, the lorry, the guy at home is paying his subscription every month just so he can drive a lorry. Okay, we're being buzzed by 109 and he's Probably looking at me right now thinking, oh, I can shoot that guy. Hang on, let me try and shoot. There he comes. You can also hear in the background some AAA fire, anti-aircraft fire. There you go. Operated by a guy called Nutson 1. But in comes this 109. So the question is, will Nutson number 1 be a good enough shot to stop the 109 from delivering his bomb cargo right on top of Corporal Slaphead? Here he comes, look. You can hear him coming in. Well, I think that's a pretty definitive no. Nutson didn't come through for me. Each game follows a similar premise. The more success you achieve, the more wealth and status you accumulate. The trouble is, to really make progress in these things, you have to put in a lot of time. The proper addicts clock up 40 hours a week. Indeed, a couple of months ago in South Korea, 
an online gaming addict actually died after playing one game continuously for 50 hours. Some people haven't got the time or patience to spend that long training to be a grand wizard, but they are prepared to pay for it. And all the big massive multiplayer games have spawned a real-world trading market worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Real dollars. In Star Wars Galaxies, for example, it can take months of constant play to achieve the status of Jedi Knight. But you know what? I don't want to play for months and months just to experience wielding a lightsaber. And thankfully, I don't have to, because of eBay. Type Star Wars Galaxies into eBay and you'll find myriad items for sale. You can buy millions of credits for just a few quid. There are guides on how to become a Jedi Knight quickly. And of course, the chance to become one of the saviors of the universe overnight. Jedi Knight. This one would cost me at least 300 quid and comes with a range of skills and weapons. He's a master defender. He's also a qualified rebel pilot. That sounds good. And then we come to his lightsaber. Let's have a look. It's a full two-headed lightsaber as well as sweep, swipe, strike, and throw moves. I haven't a clue what it means, but it sounds mean. The whole business of buying and selling assets has become so lucrative that there are now people who play these games professionally, playing intensively until they reach a desirable status, then selling that status and starting again. One chap I spoke to in Germany last week says that he can make 3,000 euros a week just by playing World of Warcraft every day. But Project Entropia takes it one stage further, encouraging players to make money. You simply convert your real-world money into Project Entropia dollars and then buy what you want, including islands, for £15,000. When you're bored of playing, which may be in 10 years' time, just convert your virtual money back into real-world cash. And if you've paid wisely, you could make a profit. Which now means that it's entirely possible to be a full-time, professional Dragon Slayer. Water is one of the most common threats to the welfare of your gadgets. According to one insurance company, it's the second most frequent cause of claims for damage to mobile phones, for example. It's not hard to think of potential water damage scenarios, leaving your precious phone or music player in your trousers pocket and putting them in the washing machine, for example, or dropping your fancy electronic car key or a digital camera into a roadside puddle. But which of your gadgets will survive a total immersion in water? And is there anything you can do to improve their chances? Well, we decided to do a thorough test. Before jumping into the pool, I'd loaded my pockets with a whole range of gadgets, none of which claim to be waterproof in any way whatsoever. And what I've got in my pockets are two mobile phones, one digital camera, one iPod shuffle, with headphones. And finally, the old transistor radio I carried into the pool with me. Let's see how wet we can get them. Water causes damage to gadgets because, except in its purest form, it conducts electricity. A gadget that's on when it hits water will develop all sorts of unintended short circuits, which can play havoc with the electronics and destroy vital components. Impurities in water also leave damaging deposits, and the chlorine often used in swimming pools is particularly nasty. After ten minutes submerged, it was time for some electronic resuscitation. So, the first thing to do with any wet gadget is to cut off the power, which means taking out the batteries, which is exactly what I'm going to do with my gadgets, except with one of my mobile phones. I'm going to leave the battery in that, leave it powered up, just as an experiment. Unfortunately, the iPod Shuffle is a sealed unit. That means the battery won't come out. All our other gadgets, though, gave up their batteries easily. Then, as far as possible, you should try and dismantle the thing. Obviously not too far, so you can't get it back together. With mobile phones, the secret is to use a Torx T6 screwdriver, which fits these particular tiny screws. 
It can take months for electronic circuits to dry out on their own, but if you do some basic disassembly, that drying becomes so much quicker. Of course, your dismantling plans may be thwarted by things like these odd triangular screws. I've never seen a screw head like that before. It's unlikely that you'll be able to dismantle any modern gadgets completely, and the last thing you want to do is break them while trying to pull them apart. The aim is to create gaps where air can get in and evaporated water can get out, something else that was impossible with the iPod Shuffle. So, having dismantled your gadgets as far as possible, which I have to say, with the modern gadgets isn't very far, the next step is to dry everything, but not with one of these. This extreme heat would cause lots of expansion and contraction and cause even more damage, which would be terrible after all this dismantling. No, you need to do something much more gentle. Like some gentle Q-tippery. This dries the places other things can't reach and also helps remove some of the water's worst impurities. As I said earlier, swimming pool and salt water is the worst. And if you have left a phone for a long time in the pool or the sea, it's a good idea, however silly it might seem, to rinse the thing briefly in filtered water to get it cleaner before drying it out. What your gadgets need next is some gentle heat, and gentle heat is what you get from a 60-watt desk lamp. And then you've just got to leave them. Resist all temptation to switch them on for at least 24 hours. We're going to leave these here overnight. Come back tomorrow and see whether any of them work. Right, after 24 hours gentle drying under our desk lamps, let's see if any of these gadgets are still alive. Try a phone first. This is the one we uh, left on. And it looks rather damp. It was utterly dead. We tried recharging the battery for a couple of hours, but the phone still didn't work. It was definitely finished. No. Absolutely no signs of life whatsoever. So what about the other phone? The one we dismantled and dried out properly? Well, it took a bit of rebuilding and then... Ah, and it's ringing. It was my wife calling. Slightly embarrassing when you're working, but it did prove the phone was functioning perfectly. And what's more, it has done ever since. Hmm, that's brilliant. Bye-bye. Hmm, -bye. well, that seems to prove our theory that um, if you take the battery out and dry the phone out, it, there's some chance of it working. So that's uh, quite good. Let's try something else. What about the digital camera? 24 hours earlier, the camera had a lens that was half full of water. Amazingly, once the batteries were in, it sprung to life straight away. Ah. It seems to be working. Let's take a picture to prove it. Right then, chaps. Very good. Smile. You're looking lovely. Yeah, it's a brilliant picture. Superbly exposed, very sharp. This is fantastic. We were on a roll, but surely my old radio with its venerable electronics and a paper speaker must have drowned. And it's working. Even the old technology is actually coming through. Andy, get your mic in on this. Actually sounds a bit more distorted. I wonder if the speaker's taken a bit of a hammering, but still an amazing success. In fact, our only real disappointment was the only gadget we couldn't dismantle at all, the iPod Shuffle. No. No. Very silent. So it seems most of your gadgets can survive an accidental dunking, as long as you dry them out properly. But should you really be buying waterproof gadgets in the first place? Later on, Susie's going to be testing a few that all claim some level of water resistance. We want to see just how much wet and wild punishment they can take. This is Tom Dunmore, Editor-in-Chief of Stuff magazine. He's here to tell us what's new in the world of gadget bags. We carry so many gadgets and bits of technology around with us these days that it's impossible to have enough pockets to put them in. So it's essential to have a decent gadget bag. Now, the good news is there are loads of really cool ones out there. Take these bags from Howie's. These are, are cycle courier bags, but they're perfect if you're going in and out of work on a bike like I do. Because these reflective road signs here make sure you're not going to get hit by a car protecting your technology and you. Crumpler make a selection of really, really excellent gadget bags from tiny little iPod covers to bags like this. This is a serious photographer's bag. In the top, you've got an laptop sleeve, 
And in the bottom, you've got space for your camera, lenses, any other gadgets you've got. This is called a farmer's double. And it really is a serious gadget bag. But if you want even more protection, how about a hard pack? Like this Axio hard pack here. You've got plenty of space for gadgets. You've got this little section for your MP3 player with a nice little hole there so you can get your headphones out. The great thing about these hard packs is they're perfect for cramped spaces. They're great for public transport. If you want to spend the night on the mountainside, you could try this. This is the Berghaus Bioflex system, and it's one of the most sophisticated rucksacks out there. The difference between this and the usual rucksack is this bit down here. It's got a huge amount of flexibility around the hip area. And what that means is when you put it on, you can actually really move your hips a lot, and the rucksack stays straight and keeps you balanced. I've worn a hell of a lot of rucksacks, and this is by far the most comfortable I've worn. We've seen bags that are for gadgets and bags that are gadgets, but these last two are both. First up is the juice bag. Now, this has got a solar panel on the front. If you open it up, you've got this little pouch here, which is where you put the gadgets that's charging. It's got just a normal car charger there. You plug your gadget in, and as you can see, my iPod there is charging in the sun. But even that isn't as impressive as the most gadgety of all bags, the Burton Liquid Lounger. Now, this is designed for thirsty snowboarders, and it's not just a, a bag, it's also a lounge. Let me show you. First thing I'm gonna need is a seat. Now, that isn't the only secret of this bag. Inside here, we've got the bar. We've got hip flask, shot glasses, bottle opener, got a cocktail stirrer, and a packet of playing cards. Fantastic. When you're out on a hillside, you need a bit of entertainment to go with your drink, which is where this comes in mighty handy. Your own radio. Now, radio is a little bit old hat for us on the gadget show, but fortunately, there's even a link that will plug into, you've guessed it, your iPod. And get that going. Here we are. Surely the most fun you can have in a bag. Stun guns are being used more and more by police forces around the world. They can stop a fully grown man in his tracks instantly without causing any major physical damage. So, how do stun guns work? Well, it's all to do with electricity. Now the thing about electricity is it always wants to complete a circuit. Even if there's an air gap with enough volts, it'll jump it. And if instead of air, you put a human body in the way, the circuit is even easier to complete. Your body is full of electricity, tiny electrical pulses which go from your brain to the muscles to tell them what to do. Now, as Jess eats this sandwich, her brain is sending electrical pulses to the muscles in her arm, telling it to contract and raise the sandwich to her mouth. It's also sending pulses to the jaw, which means it's constantly relaxing and contracting. Relaxing and contracting. Or chewing. In fact, every movement we ever make is a result of these tiny electrical signals coursing through our body. Now, if you overload the body with lots of electricity, all of those signals get confused. The result, and that's basically how stun guns work. But how do you pump lots of electricity into the body without killing it? It's all to do with the balance between volts and amps. Now, a Taser stun gun delivers 50,000 volts of electricity, but only at 0.05 amps. Now, I'll show you what that means. If this hammer represents a large voltage with the potential of doing a lot of damage to that egg, it's the speed at which I hit the egg with the hammer that represents the amps. 50,000 volts 
0.05 amps. 50,000 volts, 500 amps. So with a small enough current, stun guns can deliver enough volts to knock you flat on your face, but in such a way that you can recover instantly. This is PC Dave. Now we've had to conceal his identity because he's still a serving firearms officer. He's using a fourth generation taser which can be used in two ways. First of all, you can press the two metal terminals against the skin of your attacker, pull the trigger and 50,000 volts courses through their body, which has got to hurt. Alternatively, you can load a pressurized cartridge onto the end. Now this contains two metal probes that are linked to the taser by copper wire. And that means that you can hit someone up to 21 feet away. Then it's just a case of lining up the laser sight and pulling the trigger. Ouch. Now you can get several different types of stun gun. For example, some don't use copper wires. They use two jets of water instead. The electric current travels down one and back up the other. And even now, stun guns are being developed which shoot ionized beams of light which carry the current. Scary. Now it's time for another in our regular series of guides that show you how to get the most out of your gadgets. This week, how to recover lost documents from your computer. There are few things so frustrating as accidentally deleting a precious document or picture. But don't get depressed, because it's unlikely to have gone anywhere at all. Recovering a lost file can actually be very easy indeed. The first place to look is the recycle bin, which after all is just another folder on your desktop. To recover stuff you've deleted, right-click on the item you want to recover and select Restore. Instantly, your file is returned to its original location. Even if you've emptied the recycle bin, your file hasn't been lost forever. Because your computer won't delete information from the hard drive until it needs the space. So it's not been erased, it's just that your computer's forgotten it's there. There are a whole load of utilities available which will recover lost data from your hard drive. File Scavenger can be downloaded for free. Just enter the name or type of file you're after and hit search. In a few moments it'll show you what can be restored. Click on Recover and the file returns to its original location. If that doesn't work, then we'd recommend using a professional data recovery company like OnTrack. It's costly, but you'll be amazed what they can find. Of course, there are files that you do want to delete permanently. Go to software downloading sites and you'll find a range of programs that erase files completely, many of them free. But we like this one, WinCleaner's Destroy It Professional Edition. So effective that it apparently exceeds standards set by the US Defense Department. It's designed to permanently destroy your personal and business files, temporary folders, internet images and all previous deleted data from your hard drive so that no one can undelete it. It'll cost you £40, but you can rest assured that your girlfriend can't stumble across those incriminating traces of your late night surfing ever again. Earlier on, John demonstrated how you can, with a little TLC, dry out your precious gadgets even after they've had a thorough soaking. But I'm thinking prevention rather than cure. Surely it's much more sensible to buy gadgets that are waterproof in the first place, like this digital camera or this MP3 player. But are they really waterproof? Well, here on The Gadget Show, we never take manufacturers' claims for granted. We want to see just how much wet and wild punishment these can take. We've got three gadgets that claim some level of water resistance. And to start with, we want to test whether they can live up to their manufacturers' claims. With that in mind, we've borrowed John's inflatable pool. 
Our first contender is the 5 megapixel Pentax Optio WP, apparently waterproof to 1.5 meters. Its secret is the double locking rubber sealed battery bay, fully enclosed buttons, and the little watertight porthole that protects the three times optical zoom. I tested it shooting a bit of still life. We needed the cling film because we'd forgotten that most fruit floats. And the water was a bit murky as you can see, but the camera performed perfectly. And I think you'll agree, the results have a certain charm. Next up, we have the world's first waterproof MP3 player, the Oregon Scientific MP120. The manufacturers claim this 128 megabyte player is waterproof down to one meter. The headphone jack and USB socket are sealed in the bottom so that water can't sneak in. And the headphones come with waterproof covers so you can listen to your music in the briny. And after dancing around with it under the water for a few minutes, listening to the very catchy Gadget Show theme tune, I can tell you that the sound quality actually improved below the surface. Finally, we have the Nokia 5140 mobile phone. Now, this doesn't actually claim to be waterproof, merely splashproof, but it's already proved its toughness on the Gadget Show. It survived some very extreme testing last summer. And as no one actually sells a waterproof phone in this country yet, we feel it's earned its place in today's challenge. Oops, silly me. And after a whole minute at the bottom of the pool... Hello! Yay! It worked! It Brilliant! So it certainly lives up to the claim of being splash-proof. I think dunk-proof would be more appropriate. So the gadgets have lived up to the manufacturer's claims. That's all well and good. But if you buy a waterproof gadget, then really you want to be able to use it any time whilst doing anything. So we're going to get extreme out there. This 10 grand Sea-Doo RX-T has 215 brake horsepower and can get 70 miles an hour from its supercharged engine. There's a huge difference between a quick dip and being hit by this water at top speed. I want to take the gadgets out for a quick spin. I've got them all attached and if any of them have got any flaws or design faults, then we're sure to find them in the next couple of minutes. Well, despite being absolutely drenched, the camera certainly looked like it was working and the results bore that out. Now there's some action photography for you. The MP3 player worked perfectly throughout. Although, to enjoy your music properly on a wet bike, you probably need someone to invent some waterproof noise-cancelling headphones. To see or hear anything at all on the mobile phone, I was forced to dismount. The screen was definitely starting to look a little damp. But despite that... It's ringing. It Hello. still received calls. But by now, my ears were full of lake water and I couldn't hear a thing. It's probably my mum, so I can receive calls, but I can't hear anything. Of course, after 20 minutes in a muddy lake, all of our gadgets needed a bit of a clean. This is a pressure washer. The water leaving its nozzle is just short of boiling. When water is heated, its molecules become less dense, and under this sort of pressure, those molecules will be forced into any minuscule gaps in our gadgets. The phone, the display is still working. The MP3 player, let's see if that's still banging out the tunes. It sure is. And finally, the camera. Take a little picture, and I think that is working. So, it seems our gadgets can deal with even quite extreme conditions, but we wanted to know whether any of them could cope with water's most destructive capability, the colossal, crushing pressure it exerts at depth. To be waterproof, a gadget obviously needs to be sealed, but this traps air inside. Put it in the water and the pressure outside is greater. The water then tries to force its way in, essentially crushing anything in its way. 
The depth it can go to depends on how much pressure it can take before the casing cracks. We can't do a depth test in the lake because we need a controlled environment, so it's back to John's pool. We've called in our resident explosives expert to create an underwater blast that will simulate depth pressure. In this case, a force of 20 kilograms per square centimetre, equivalent to a depth of about 20 metres, a good scuba diving depth. Remember, according to the manufacturers, the camera and the MP3 player are only good for a metre or so, and the phone isn't actually waterproof. Here we go. <laughs> well, not exactly an earth-shattering explosion, and unsurprisingly, all of our gadgets survived completely unscathed. Luckily, though, our explosives expert had brought along some extra kit, so we can do it all again, except this time with a much bigger bag. There's no point in messing around, so we're going to simulate the pressure our gadgets would experience at a depth of 200 metres. They don't stand a chance. The force of the explosion created a 13,000 mile an hour pressure wave and has ruined John's pool. There's just no way they can have survived that in a million years. Where are they? Well, certainly the swimming pool hasn't survived it. Let's have a look at the phone, which you can see here. Let's try and switch that on. No, as suspected, but not surprisingly, the phone has had it. Where's everything else? Right, the MP3 player. Let's turn that on. See if that comes on. You are not going to believe this. Well, I can tell you that the display is working and incredibly listen to this there is the gadget show theme tune loud and clear that's incredible just one more to go then the camera let's have a look switch it on <gasps> look at that it's taken a picture perfectly Despite being drenched time after time and blown up twice, <laughs> the camera and MP3 player have passed our tests with flying colours, performing above and beyond their manufacturers' rather conservative claims. But, unbelievably, the story doesn't end there. As we packed away to leave, the phone still had one more surprise for us. I've just... I'm just going to put the gadgets away. I've just finished filming and everything. And... I don't know if you can see, I'm going to try and show it to you, but the, the phone has decided... The phone's working. Hang on, let me see if I can actually hear. Oh, my goodness. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me talking, Susie? Can you hear me talking, Susie? Hello? Can you hear that? It turns out that the force of our explosion may have squeezed out some of the water that was trapped inside. So, next time you drop your phone down the loo, don't dry it out, just blow it off. Being all new, it's likely to be more expensive than HD DVD on launch, but it does have greater.